As we move towards bringing children back to school, we must ask who was worst affected by the pandemic and why. Decoding Exclusion, an interview series by the Vithi Centre for Legal Policy, aims to discuss the various facets of the problem of exclusion in education in India. With a range of experts in the field of law, policy and education, we examine evidence on new sites of exclusion and ways in which we can support children and their households as we bring them back to school. Welcome to Vidhi's Decoding Exclusion, an interview series where we break down the various facets of exclusion from mainstream education in India. I'm Nisha and I lead the Inclusive Education Vertical at the Vidhi Centre for Legal Policy and in today's episode I'm in conversation with Namya Mahajan, co-founder at Rocket Learning. Rocket Learning is an NGO that links government schools and Anganwadi systems with parents through technology, media and social influence techniques with the purpose of making quality early childhood education universally accessible. In today's conversation, we discuss evidence on the deprioritization of education of younger children over that of older children during COVID-19 and the various barriers that allowed for such deprioritization to occur, especially at the level of the household. Specifically, we talk about how models like rocket learning attempt to raise awareness around the criticality of early childhood education and the role that parents can play in enhancing learning during the early years. We also talk about the importance of working with the state to achieve scale in the delivery of ECE and addressing some of the adverse perceptions that the public has towards public schooling. The conversation gives us a lot of direction to think about how we should move towards the formalization of early childhood education along the lines of the national education policy. So with that, let's jump into it. One of the first things we wanted to ask you was, so the rocket learning model, right? Um, it's essentially completely an ed tech based model. And uh, the idea has been to kind of uh, provide educational material to children and parents on WhatsApp. Um, so it's, you know, quite a novel idea. It's quite different from a lot of other ed tech programs out there as well. Um, and I think during COVID, it really sort of picked up, right? Um, and it, it was in many ways a model that almost perfectly fit what COVID needed um, in terms of sort of low tech, in terms of uh, a focus on early childhood, um, you know, focus on sort of smaller video sizes and things like that. Uh, but what I wanted to sort of ask you about was how did you all come up with this model or what was the design um, or the concept behind the design like? Uh, because it was obviously a model that was designed even prior to the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, and you sort of touched on actually, so I think the model was always supposed to be actually online and offline to some extent. Uh, the reason we sort of went fully online was mainly COVID, um, but sort of the inspiration for the model, a lot of it came from a combination of, um, so I'd worked in SEVA before, which is the Self-Employed Women's Association for folks who don't know. Um, it's sort of one of India's largest and oldest organizations working with women in the informal economy. And one of the models that sort of they pioneered along with Grameen, along with, uh, you know, a lot of other folks was this, you know, women's self-help group. Um, and that sort of was such a, you know, novel um, model that sort of changed the way that, uh, you know, credit and sort of, you know, how you see uh, lower income communities, right, whether you see them as bankable. So it was such a sort of novel idea. And, uh, you know, my interest in early childhood education and what I saw of self Help groups kind of came together at Rocket, right? So the idea was, uh, can you make a self-help group, which is sort of basically, uh, you know, something that changes social norms, that creates community and solidarity around uh, credit and, uh, you know, uh, also mental health these days. And can you use that for education, right? So can you change norms around early learning um, and its importance and what you can do and what it means, right? Uh, including sort of play-based learning. So I think that's where really the inspiration came. And there'd been sort of successful models like Reach Up in Jamaica and later sort of all over the world, right? Reach Up had shown that parental um, uh, interventions and, uh, you know, them being part of sort of learning and how they respond to children is, you know, massively impactful. But we saw very little evidence of these programs scaling in any kind of quality way, right? Uh, because when you, you know, try to scale as a uh, as a sort of community organization, uh, you know, nobody has the budgets, you know, to have one person for every group. And if you go to a group of 
you know people every month or so slowly that dies down right like i think credit ha- is a different um you know i think it's sort of everyday important i think with something like education uh you know life gets in the way the groups become inactive so sort of you know how do you take that model that's worked um to scale in a quality way really sort of technology seem to be the answer right because uh i think no one can be in every household no ngo can be in every household uh, i think if you want to be in every household you have to be either the indian government or you yeah. know a tv or a phone right so um Uh, so we kind of married those so we have you know the government involved we work through anganwadi systems we have you know a phone that sort of can actually reach parents every day uh in a way that they sort of that makes sense to them we used whatsapp because every parent with a smartphone had whatsapp so rather than sort of forcing someone to download something that they're not familiar with um you know understand a new set of notifications why not work on something that already sort of creates community right brings community together so very long answer but basically the inspiration was sort of the self help group and parental interventions for early learning all over the world and sort of how do you bring them uh, into the new age when 70% of parents have smartphones uh, in their home right so i mean that that's really interesting because i think um, at least as far as you know i understood the model and have known it i think i've only known it as how you guys have pivoted once covid hit right so i've only known it as the tech model so th- this is really interesting so when you talk about this offline aspect of it and bringing in that community focus so of course one thing you'll have done is doing that on whatsapp itself right so using whatsapp groups having the anganwadi worker or the educator on a whatsapp group and in some sense that brings in that community element uh, but could you tell us a little bit about what the offline model or the hybrid model was uh, going to be about and is that something that you all are thinking of bringing back yeah that's that's a great question so i think again the offline model we wanted to make sure it was quite low touch and something that could eventually be handed over to governments right because um we could do a very yeah. intensive community based model but you know we've seen that very few of those actually translate uh, when you try to do them at scale and you have to partner with governments for scale right so um it will continue right. to be low touch what we're trying to do is bring in sort of touch points that already exist within the community so for instance um anganwadis are uh, you know prescribed like you know the, the, there's a policy around having an ecce day every month uh right and um you know to have sort of mothers meetings or fathers meetings where children's development is discussed and you know a lot of people are very cynical about the system they say that you know nothing happens you know ration blah blah but you know we're really quite bullish about the system right um anganwadi workers are incredibly motivated they're doing so much with um honestly very often very little support or resources yeah. or space right so our feeling really has been that if you give them sort of you know you tell them to do ece day but they don't know what to do on ece day right so if you give them sort of simple ideas of what to do um that sort of you know often works and so and it won't work for everyone but it will work for a large number of people who are just trying to do the best they can right so we've been sending out again sort of digitally bite sized but ideas for you know here's how you do a parent chopal or a parent meeting here's how you uh, you know you can have sort of different tables where you demonstrate different activities you help parents experience play based learning um and sort of you know bring communities together right so i think that's one i think one is uh portion ma which is um a government initiative for uh, bringing awareness in the community around nutrition um can that sort of you know one of the things that the government took up this year was uh, having an element of early childhood learning in this portion month right so Um, i think there's also been studies showing that interventions that combine nutrition and early learning are often often see the best sort of take up and results later right so we're trying to um you know combine those in some way and the governments also uh, now have you know the portion mame there was a week called portion bhi padhai bhi where uh, you know the, again anganwadi workers were asked to demonstrate simple activities around early learning and responsive caregiving that parents could then take up so i think it looks kind of like that like leveraging um, you know touch points physical touch points to bring in parents to demonstrate what they can do uh, which a sort of purely digital model will sort of exclude parents who are not natural or immediate tech adopters right. 
you know, coming coming to sort of, uh, you mentioned this reach up curriculum thing as well, right? And one of the things that um, the reach up curriculum, like you said, did or, you know, provided evidence for was this model of parental engagement. And again, that's something that's very much central to what rocket learning does. Uh, and so, I mean, just to sort of give the audience a little bit of an idea, rocket learning's um, educational content that gets sent on WhatsApp is sort of targeted to um, parents, right? Or like the older person, anyone elder than the actual target child, uh, with the idea that you can sort of teach that person how to teach the child on these simple sort of educational activities. And of course, sorry, no, you can like correct me and like add all, all the, you know, the detail to that um, as well. But so one of the things that we sort of found um, in our study, which I touched upon a little bit before, was that during COVID-19, because there were a lot of stressors on the households, there was job losses, um, education obviously was deeply prioritized at the level of the state and the household as well, because a lot of sort of energy and monetary investments went into, uh, you know, this health shock sort of aspect of it, right? So people sort of being concerned about their own health as well as if they actually did contract COVID and all of that. Um, and I mean, this, of course, was something that also affected like funding at the level of NGOs, right, and civil society as well. But within the household, one of the things we did see was that when they started to uh, be able to reprioritize education, maybe a lot of that effort went into the older children. Right. Um, and some amount of that, when we at least spoke to parents for, you know, other studies, some amount of that was explained by parents saying that the older child can use the phone. You know, yeah. they know how to use a smartphone. They're able to sort of navigate technology. For younger children, we need to be there. And then it becomes a matter of our own sort of time investment and energy as well. And for a lot of parents, they didn't know how to do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that that was sort of another kind of barrier that became a part of it. And then in other cases, it was, you know, board exams. It, and this is something that always happens with us, right? So board exams became a huge sort of source of concern. And anyone around that age group or maybe even seventh to tenth grade um, became the sort of focus of the household. So um, what we sort of wanted to, you know, you have been engaging with children and parents of children who are in this, um, you know, three to about eight years of yeah. age, right? And that's sort of the target age group that we found to be, there was even evidence from other studies of like lower enrollments um, in primary and early uh, childhood. So as, has this been something that's come out through your experience as well? Have parents spoken about this and what were the kind of challenges that, they described yeah absolutely um i think this is absolutely when we used to speak to parents who were not active or who had been active but dropped off that's something we constantly heard right there's one phone in the household so you know smartphone avail availability in the household is not uh, a guarantee that you know the child will have access to it right because yeah. it might leave the home in the morning um, and when it comes back it's usually in the hands of either the father or the oldest son in many cases uh, although things are changing I think uh, in terms of you know gender in education which are really encouraging um, but I think that's something we heard constantly right and uh, you know we have you know, a beloved uh, framework that we call AIM at Rocket Learning, where, uh, you know, the A stands for awareness, that sort of early learning is really important. I think there's um, a lot of, uh, in the, you know, in communities, there's a misconception that, you know, early learning isn't so important because, you know, every child will eventually learn to speak or read. And that's true, but there are other things that sort of are crucial at that age that, you know, it, it will become more difficult for them to pick up later, right? So, the, you know, there's a lack of awareness that, uh, you know, early learning is important, that parents can be involved in early learning as well, right? As you said, um, you know, parents, uh, I think a large reason for schools to exist is that parents need kids to be out of the house, right? And uh, that's true across the board. And uh, it's it's hard for parents to engage and sort of the awareness that, you know, how critical their engagement is at that age has not yet percolated, right? So I think India did an amazing job at school enrollment. I think, you know, the message that like education leads to better future, like that is mm -hmm. so prevalent in our, you know, in our country in a way that is not true, I think in the US um, or in sort of sometimes in the Western world. So I think we did a great job at that. I think there needs to be like new awareness campaigns around the criticality of the early years. I think that's sort of missing right now in the general consciousness. So the A is awareness, aspiration. I is information, which is sort of 
making it really easy right like have information that's curated that's in your local language that gives you something to do that day that is easy to do using materials in your environment and sort of empower like gives you agency right rather than sort of talking down to you or making you feel inadequate so you know i think that confidence is also missing that parents think we haven't studied so what will we teach our kid let them go to school and learn from these teachers right i think that also needs to change and so you know our videos are always bite sized two minutes local language using sort of you know we substitute clay with atta we you know we substitute blocks with aloo and tomato because why not right that's what's available at homes and we really want parents to feel that they can do something and that it's easy um right and the m for us stands for motivation and measurement so um you know i always use the example that i aspire to be fit i have all the information in the world on how to be fit but when i stick with a fitness program it's usually because i have a community around me that sort of encourages me there's a social norm that you are you know you have to be fit um and i'm getting some kinds of reminders of progress right like i could you know hold 2 kilos yesterday and today i can do 5 right that's really motivating so you know that's what we attempt to do through our nudges that we try to give parents um you know the sense that you know there's other people on this group your neighbors are doing it your teacher is encouraging you or your anganwadi didi uh, is encouraging you and you're getting sort of this report card the certificate something that's telling you you're on the right track and that someone's watching right so i think those things um you know if you have a tech that's completely divorced from uh you know the community from the teacher or that's completely one way information that's not going to solve this problem right you're going to need to have sort of you need to be playing across these sort of three things uh in order to sort of you know make technology work and be available for younger children right right so i think a bunch of um very interesting points that you brought up right so one is when you were talking about sort of the constraint of the household because when we talk about something like deprioritization of the education of one child over the other whether it's you know younger older whether it's you know male female um at the end of the day what's extremely important is that i think no household wants to do this right like you said the awareness that education is important for the future and how that's permeated our society i think 100 100% true we have done a great job with that and with enrollments and with that comes the idea that no parent genuinely wants to choose the education of one child over the other right and so ultimately it is only when there are constraints in the household that they're forced to sort of make those decisions and i think that's something that's like really important for us to constantly sort of reiterate right and um one of the reasons you know whether we're even doing these conversations is so we spoke to for example indus action right and their entire model is about like how can we um sort of solve for the social security of a household as a unit but when it comes to it you know the household is not forced to sort of deprioritize the health or nutrition or education of their children right um so i mean that that i think is a really sort of important point uh, to keep in the back of like all of these conversations um you know never to say that it's a parent who's choosing to sort of choose one child over the other um having said that again like you said the idea that they need to be given um or like we need to create this new narrative of the importance of early childhood um sort of stimulation and education right not just limited to and again when you talk about the reach up curriculum i think the other thing that reach up does is also talk about the 0 to 3 age group right Absolutely, and yeah. actually starting much earlier with very basic sort of stimulation in the household um to kind of bring uh, children i mean a range of sort of cognitive development um and again like you said bringing in that health aspect as well um so sort of coming to what maybe the state's role can be when we talk about parental engagement right because i think again with all of this evidence that's been developed over the years we've understood that a household that has like say more educated parents or parents who are, rather than more educated parents parents who are able to sort of um yeah. you know, move past the barriers that prevent them from engaging with the child's education when we're able to do that it actually can be a huge equalizing factor right with when it comes to the child's learning and uh, their ability to like stay in school even so given that what what we sort of see is the state's role in encouraging parental engagement right and it's it's a slightly tricky thing because we also have to sort of acknowledge that when there are constraints in the household 
um, even parents who do want to be engaged, right, might find it hard to because of things like time, because they have paid work, um, you know, mm -hmm. so during COVID, maybe there were some parents who were able to give a lot more time. And now as they start going back to work full time, um, you know, how do they sort of navigate this, right? So how do we kind of make from a policy perspective, parental engagement and agenda without inadvertently sort of shifting the burden of education away from the school and into the household. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked this question because I think it's it's an important one. And sometimes there's this sort of misunderstanding about our work, right? That sort of, you know, you know, where have you seen, it, you know, education not happen in a school and only happen at homes, right? And I think we have to sort of say this quite often that, um, you know, the idea was never to, um, you know, uh, replace schools, right? The the idea was always to kind of, and, and sort of not what you're implying, but people have asked us this, right? Uh, so the idea was never to sort of replace schools. The idea was always that, how do you supplement or complement schooling, right? By sort of... Um, an environment at home that fosters uh, learning and curiosity and, uh, you know, playful learning, the ability to make mistakes, um, which are things, honestly, that are kind of missing from the school system today, right? And if they're not done at homes, then uh, it, it you know, it's more difficult for a child. So I'd say, like, you know, there are maybe three things, right? So the first is that, um, you know, kids spend maybe at most six hours or eight hours a day at school, the rest of the day they're spending at home, right? At preschool or Anganwadi, it's going to be maybe three hours a day, right? The rest of the time they are at home. And so they are learning from parents every day, right? Uh, they learn from the way that their parents speak to them, the way that they interact, um, you know, what things are valued, is effort valued or is achievement valued? So, you know, there are sort of you know, beyond sort of the daily activities that we send, uh, right? There's the whole stream of work that we're doing around how do you change parental perceptions around what is early learning, right? Um, which is something that the state should, you know, possibly needs to pick up, right? Which is sort of changing this narrative, as you were saying, around uh, what constitutes high quality early learning, right? Is it just learning ABC and one, two, three, yeah. or is it, uh, you know, helping a child sort of learn how to think, uh, make connections, you know, interact with objects around them. So I think that's really important. I think the second is that, you know, given all this time that, you know, kids spend around their parents or who are usually their primary caregivers, uh, there's sometimes this misconception that parents naturally know what to do. And I think that's just not true, right? Like no parent at any social economic strata knows what to do. There's mommy blogs and influencers, right? We like, I think every new parent, every young parent and the parents we work with are 22, 23, like they're yeah. so young, right? They're actually looking for support and validation and, you know, a group of peer group that understands what they're going through so sort of one of some of my favorite you know comments um from parents have been fathers saying we didn't really know how, how to interact with our child right when our child is three or four years old we would come back and we would have say 20 30 minutes with our child and we weren't really sure what to do right um so i think baking in sort of this kind of quality engagement uh, or engagement with learning or with play, which is learning at this age and making that into daily routines, right? So that it's not a burden on a parent that, you know, you have to do this after, uh, you know, or in addition to all the other stuff that you do, but, you know, can you, while your child is around you, while you're cooking or when you come back from work, um, right? Whether it's a father cooking and a mother coming back from work, right? Yeah. Um, how do you make those moments that you have with a child more uh, rich, right? And especially for zero to three, as you mentioned, I think a lot of um, responsive nurturing care is tied to routines around feeding, right? So I think those just go together so well, they're so complementary uh, that I think, again, sort of making room and making a narrative around what that could look like in a parent's daily routine without burdening them uh, is right. really sort of an important policy lever as well. Um, and I think the third is, again, sort of, you know, coming back to this thread of, uh, you know, just helping, you know, make things available, right? Making things clearer, right? Like we have all the information in the world at our fingertips now with a the phone. There's, you know, a gazillion hours of 
children's content on YouTube. Uh, but a lot of it is sort of a child passively consuming information. And those things are not... Um, at least the research so far, maybe it's been conducted on birds, but you know, birds <laughs> seem to learn to sing better from their parent than from a video, uh, right? Even if it's exactly the same thing. So, um, uh, so you know, parents being part of sort of this process, right? Um, and sort of being told that their role is not merely to be a provider or to like give a you know give a device, but to actually be. Um, you know, active and to make it easy. I think that, that's the other thing. So, uh, you know, creating those norms, uh, creating, you know, routines and habits, and then sort of making it very easy for people to follow them, uh, for parents and caregivers to feel supported. And uh, I think sort of those are the things that go into creating this community. Right, right. So I think based on, you know, the combination of the different like levers that you're pointing out, right, because you're sort of talking about um, the amount of time that children spend at home. And of course, that continues to be true even as we get yeah. older, of course, until about, I guess, 20 or something. But, um, you know, during that time, there's also the element of, um, like you said, health, there's nutrition, there's all of these things. And you said, like, you know, the um, like clubbing these things with the sort of feeding cycle and the natural like points of interaction that parents and children anyway sort of have in their household so I guess a lot of it is as far as like the state would be concerned and where their role might fit in would it be fair to say that the Anganwadi is maybe the place for this right in terms of if we were to think about it from a policy perspective what is the best place for the state to try and whether it's creating the narrative or providing the information yeah. or, you know, whatever their sort of intervention is, is it fair to say that at least in our current infrastructure, yeah. the Anganwadi is the place for this? Yeah, we do believe so. So there was some interest in preschooling around NEP, et cetera, but yeah. um, that you know, seems to be an investment that a lot of education systems are not able to make at the moment. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, Anganwadi's exist. They're, actually a very exciting I think uh, model which is not uh, uh, which doesn't exist elsewhere in the develop, uh, developing world and uh, or the developed world actually I think India has the largest network of daycare centers in the world we have you know 1.4 million Anganwadi centers and you know I am actually quite excited and you know in the potential of this to travel as a model right um, the, the ASHA model the community health worker model is sort of all over, uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. Uh, you know, so much of global health is now predicated on uh, the community health worker. And, um, you know, as, you know, awareness around how important ECD and ECE is, um, you know, a lot of this is being done privately by private providers say in, you know, in Kenya or South Africa or Peru. There are these, um, you know, community centers, basically local women who are, you know, um, uh, running these centers, but they're really expensive to run, uh, especially with nutrition. So, uh, you know, they're looking for our systems for, you know, government sus subsidies, etc. So I think this model of a public or public supported uh, daycare center is going to travel. And so, yeah, I think one of the things we're really excited about as an organization is, um, you know, how do we develop a best in class kind of, uh, you know, public daycare system and a sort of model for supporting, uh, you know, this daycare worker who is from the community um, in a way that can actually travel around the world. Right, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, and like you said, right, with the NEP um, and sort of this idea that we're going to move towards more, um, formalization and maybe we can come back to the question of formalization but um you know we're sort of trying to formalize in law at least the right to early childhood education and development um so i do think it's also like a really important time to kind of ask these questions right of like you know we have this existing infrastructure of anganwadi centers like you said it's possibly one of the most incredible sort of community-based networks 
uh, that you see anywhere in the world that sort of covers so many of these really important aspects of ECD. And if you think about it, India has sort of been developing this ICDS thing since what, 1975 or something, right? So it's not, I mean, it's taken so many years to get us to this point. Um, and it's a truly incredible system. So sort of thinking about how we can leverage that to create this narrative, because if we come back to this question of, you know, deprioritization of early childhood, um, as well as primary education in a time of crisis, I think having that sort of narrative in place might be the, you know, the part where the state can really sort of um, maybe create more resilience in some sense, right? Because when parents and all of us as a community recognize the importance of this stage of, of schooling and um, also are able to kind of consider how to continue these kinds of engagements in the household, um, yeah. that's, that's when we can really sort of protect ourselves from shocks, right? Um, okay, yeah. So yeah, I think the Anganwadi system is then potentially the, the place that we really need to be focusing and strengthening, even when we look at what the NEP has in store for us. Um, you know, when we talk about the Anganwadi system, one of the most, um, I think, well-documented aspects of it is the fact that Anganwadi workers are often extremely overburdened, right? Yeah. So while it is a tremendous system, one of the reasons it is tremendous is because the ICDS scheme sort of has six different, very core responsibilities from like neonatal and maternal health care to nutrition of the child, immunization, and then early childhood education as well, among, you know, a few other things. And in recent years, they've also sort of added programs for adolescent girls. And again, truly tremendous. It's incredible what this scheme has really achieved. Having said that, though, the Anganwadi worker and the Anganwadi helper uh, and the limited sort of resources that they have, which you also sort of alluded to, um, is definitely a source of concern, right? And if we want to strengthen the scheme, if we want to improve any aspect of these key responsibilities that it already plays, then we really need to consider what kind of support systems we can have for them. And um, there is a lot of talk about tech being maybe something that can help this system right mm -hmm. um in some in some ways but then also at the same time tech has if you know not been implemented properly become a burden right and during covid of course it happened too rapidly when there was no time to kind of pivot and learn and provide training and things like that but you know tech was a burden for many workers and for teachers who needed to learn how to create content learn how to use it all of these things, right? So given what we know about the burden of Anganwadi workers um, and how like there is evidence of them not being able to give more than like 24 minutes for yeah. ECE, given how busy their day is, right? Um, so how, how do we sort of maybe use tech in the most efficient ways um, for things like scaling, for things like quality, and, you know, even to be innovative in teaching techniques, like you said, give them ideas of how to run the ECE day and things like that. But yeah. at the same time, also find ways to not make it a burden on them, right? So how, how do we sort of, how do we prevent that from happening? Yeah, thank you for that question also. It's a huge priority for us, right? I, uh, you know, fully agree with you that, um, you know, a lot of tech is seen, for instance, as purely a monitoring tool. And uh, it's a data collection tool. Uh, and no data is ever provided back to the Anganwadi worker, right? So um, one of the things that sort of, you know, our tech was built on was that uh, we should never have to ask for data from the Anganwadi worker, right? Or at least that should be absolute minimal. Um, you know, one form is okay, more than that is not. So, you know, just making sure that um, you're not sort of, forcing uh, a monitoring mechanism through tech without giving any support through it, uh, right? Uh, we also tried to make sure that data is available to the Anganwadi worker. So we found that, so the report cards that we sent out to parents were a great tool for an Anganwadi worker to see which kids in her class were getting support from home, which kids were not, right? So those kinds of things I think can be provided, right? Like making, reducing the burden on them saying, Saying, hey, you don't need to visit all these kids because actually the ASHA worker is visiting them. So I think one of the things that is happening is this huge redundancy between mm. the ASHA, the AM, and the Anganwadi worker, right? Um, who is sort of, you know, who are all potentially doing sort of similar things at certain points. So, you know, 
using tech to rationalize to make uh, you know an anganwadi workers day more um, reasonable right uh, also reducing responsibilities that are not children related we found when we actually spoke to anganwadi workers that they're also sort of doing because they're the person in the community who is employed by the government they're often given responsibilities like you know collection of plastic bags right for recycling uh, which is sort of completely unrelated to what they need to be doing right so i think part of building the narrative also has to be sort of sensitizing the department's own people and maybe you know other government people that this is sort of a crucial responsibility that they have that taking care of young children is uh, sort of you know so key for for everyone so um i think sort of going back to technology i think uh you know having it give sort of simple uh you know information that's curated reducing the effort to find information reducing the effort to collect data and sort of not be given data and um helping you know upskill right as you were saying like a large uh, you know there are anganwadi workers who don't know how to fill in a form or um you know even use whatsapp or go on youtube and sort of helping upskill anganwadi workers for that empowers them to do a bunch of other stuff a bunch of our younger anganwadi workers you know you ask them what do you do when you sort of visit a child and you don't know what to do and they say you know we ask a supervisor the, the supervisor is available google to matlab hey he right yeah youtube to hey he so i think you know you empower people when you teach them to use information uh, and to find information these days um and so i think that needs to be sort of a central part of whatever sort of tech related initiatives we do right right so i mean this is again interesting right because you have in your model maybe found ways to kind of minimize these things but like you said the larger sort of system approach has been that anganwadi workers maybe this like redundancy redundancy problem is one thing where there's maybe need for more convergence between the different departments i feel like this is a conversation we have no matter where in the education sector you look right and i feel like it's going to be a extremely important conversation when we start to say the ministry of education will take over early childhood right in whatever form it is being discussed in the nep um but also uh, you know the the thing you said about uh tech being used largely for monitoring of data and it not sort of coming back to the worker so given that your model has tried to kind of change the way in which this is done and given that you guys work with the state as well right when you all are doing your implementation is this um, are these sort of aspects of the model sort of taken back to the state and how have they you know responded is it something where we can potentially um look for a more like system um you know a systematic change across states perhaps in the way that we do some of these things yeah i i think it you know will be a journey i think it probably will not happen uh, immediately uh, that sort of you know i think it's hard to build good technology i think yeah. there's a reason that tech companies uh, often spend so much time and money on kind of you know product on really sort of every feature right like um i had a friend who used to work on facebook ads within ads uh, right so uh, there it's it's a tough thing for to make a product that works for 1.4 million people who are using it every day all day right so mm-hmm. it's not a trivial problem that i think will be solved immediately like making sort of tech systems that at work well um but uh, i think that we are you know, sort of going along the right track hopefully yeah. right where um if things are sort of system linked then the need for filling in data reduces um you know i think there is an attempt at convergence uh, which hopefully will sort of get further um so yeah so i think that there are sort of these attempts to build high quality public goods around technology and that will happen slowly uh, right. and sort of in the meantime at least encouraging people to you know have their own work arounds i think is useful there are i think uh, you know sometimes there's an attempt to say that you know whatsapp or youtube should not be available because 
people will just waste time on it or something like that, right? So I think, um, you know, people who want to waste time will find a way to waste time has kind of been our approach. So, uh, you know, and, and that sort of deprives people who are motivated of the tools that they need uh, to sort of go forward. So I think throwing out technology is also not the answer. And I think that um, that uh, sort of thought process is also slowly going away, which is really right. helpful. I think we're going along the right ways, but it's really hard to build a product that works for everyone. So I think that will you know take a while. Right, right. No, absolutely. That That's fair. Um, so another sort of question I had along similar lines, when we talk about the problem of out of school children, yeah. one of the key kind of issues that does come up is, of course, tracking children, right? So for the state to be able to say these are the number of children who were born, and then they have now entered the education system, they have now left the system, sometimes it's short term, sometimes it's you know, they have dropped out and being able to sort of document and track this, I think, is one of the largest sort of problems with this question of out of school children. Right. And even when we're trying to bring them back to school. Um, and of course, I mean, again, tech may be potentially the solution here, but also do we think that, um, again, like I, I think I may be both overestimate um, but also, I think, rightly estimate how important the Anganwadi system is and all of this. But given that the Anganwadi system is sort of placed at that point of birth of the child, right, or actually prior to birth of the child, because they do also do maternal and neonatal child care and things like that. Um, do we think that there's room to maybe build a system of tracking starting right from this age, right? And should that potentially be one of the places that we come in when we talk about converging the role of the Ministry of Education with, you know, what's sort of happening um, mm. with the ICDS scheme. Um, I mean, again, provided we have the right kind of resources and support and all of that, not within maybe the existing system, but yeah. do you think that maybe that's a place that this could fit in? Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. And honestly, it's not something uh, I thought about, but you're absolutely right because, yeah, the, I mean, the ASHA or the Anganwadi worker uh, are sort of you know, enmeshed with the child from before they're even born. So absolutely, I think if there was a way to, um, you know, help children, uh, to help sort of, yeah, children be recorded in the in the system and help them, um, uh, you know, help keep track. I think one issue that we've seen and that also happens with children who are migrants um, or from migrant families uh, is also this lack of tracking, right? So a yeah. lot of um, malnourished children uh, are also sort of, you know, they're just not in the system because they moved from somewhere else. And so they uh, were not enrolled or they were not, uh, you know, kept track of. So I think um, that could be a really actually important use of this uh, kind of technology where you could sort of see where this child was in the larger system, uh, both from a, you know, as you were saying, from a nutrition, vaccination, you know, healthcare, uh, and education lens to ensure that they don't sort of slip through the cracks. Right, yeah. Because the other thing that I think is so important about this system is this community angle, right? There are so few, I mean, ministries and the way in which we actually deliver public goods that are so um, sort of built from the community because our Asha workers, our Anganwadi workers are women who belong to the same community in which they are then sort of providing all of these services. And I think I, I don't, I can't imagine a way to sort of replicate that kind of, you know, connection with the community. Um, yeah, so like tech would sort of be the tool to kind of document what they are already in some sense doing, right? Because I don't know if you've had this experience with uh, Anganwadi workers when you interact with them where they sort of off the top of their head they can tell you everything about everyone right especially the, the kids like they already know and they're like huh they've gone to this uncle's house for three months so you know they'll come next month that kind of thing and it's just all there at their fingertips yeah one of our one of my favorite memories from the field is uh, you know we've been told that Anganwadi workers have difficulty talking to fathers in many cases about their children's development and so we went to this um, Anganwadi in uh, Maharashtra. We asked the Anganwadi worker, like, you know, do you have trouble talking to fathers? And she's like, me? 
they came to my anganwadi the fathers so like they should be scared of me uh, right so yeah absolutely right they're so deeply embedded i think the other thing is that they um are, are actually a little bit older than um i originally expected so they tend to be sort of over 30 which means they've married into this community and are broadly going to stay here so yeah absolutely like i think in rural areas they're so deeply embedded it, it is a little bit different in rural versus urban areas yeah. but in the urban areas there's more of a disconnect they might be coming from further away um right they might not be as deeply embedded um so i think there sort of this sensitization or like being part of the community really becomes important um maybe as a form of training as well right. um and i think in urban areas also this problem of children just slipping through the cracks because uh they're also divorced from their local community right it might be a uh you know young couple that's just migrated um and they don't know where to go so i think um you know again sort of i keep going back to like mass awareness and sort of making this narrative that you know wherever you are right you have this entitlement of uh you know food uh, nutritious food for your child for education for your young child uh, immunization and sort of you know this is something that you can demand of your uh you know of your you know of your local sort of community uh, person as well i think that's going to be pretty crucial along with sort of the technology right because if people don't know who to ask mm -hmm. it's a little bit more difficult yeah no absolutely yeah i think that that's a really important point um okay so one of my sort of next questions a little bit i think deviating from what we've been talking about but coming back to the bit on tech right yeah. so um with technology and again given what nep as well as all our sort of latest education um you know the discourse is sort of moving towards saying how can we bring hybrid sort of modes of education in how can we encourage the use of tech uh, for like better quality education etc um and one of the things that we saw during covid of course there is a digital divide that's been well documented some people have access some people don't and that's something that is also rapidly sort of changing and covid itself gave a huge push in terms of penetration of smartphones and even the internet right um and people's comfort with that but there is this other aspect of tech not being inclusive of say for example children with disabilities right and this is i think something that we've actually spoken about before um you know yeah me as well a concern that you know we've had before uh but yeah so like during covid for example we did this study and we found that you know um the government say uh, tv channels that were giving out educational classes during covid uh, didn't have for example sign language uh, you know interpretation or subtitling so children with hearing disabilities were not able to access that kind of content and then similarly when we moved to like google meet or zoom if you had a teacher sharing a screen a child with a visual disability you know could in access it and a lot of this is also i mean maybe in some cases it is the sort of i mean apathy of the state to maybe consider from the get go when starting with some technology right or when starting with something we often forget that we need to sort of be inclusive and instead there's a later point when we kind of come to it and we say oh these children were left out right so given yeah. again that rocket learning you know the scale you guys have reached so much of it is done in partnership with the state right and you guys have a tremendous model that is inclusive in all these other ways in terms of being adaptable being context specific it's in different languages so you all have addressed this problem of inclusion in so many different ways um but so where do you think the state should sort of role should be to say that you know when we partner can we maybe make it mandatory and I, i mean i know this is probably as someone who's creating the product a nightmare for you but you know um should the state sort of be intervening and saying okay we'll do this in partnership but you have to ensure that it is inclusive for these children as well yeah yeah i think that's such a good question and it's such a complicated issue right because um i mean uh, there's exclusion at so many different levels right in the gov in in this in, in the communities that we work with that it can seem difficult right because you're also uh, i mean you know if the state had said that uh, we will not use any content unless it sort of follows da, 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 like all of these um you know uh 
factors that make it you know use, usable by uh, kids with sort of physical or hearing impairments um that would probably have meant sort of a longer delay right unless yeah. you can also make sort of funding available and resources and products available to for people to do this more easily right um so it's sort of also then you know are you excluding other folks but i think like one really useful lens with uh, this these days is of course the universal design right which says that uh, you know when you design for people with um uh you know with impairments then you're also helping other folks right so for anybody listening who is not sort of part of this i learned this recently which is sort of you know the cut curve effect it's called sometimes where like if you give a slope to pavements then it that was done for users of wheelchairs but then it was useful for um you know parents uh pushing prams it was useful for some you know workers carrying a heavy load so again right you you support so many other kinds of people um so i think that you know we do need to move towards that i think uh having sort of guidelines or or saying that you know you know maybe mandating subtitling is useful um we have found though we started subtitling and we found that uh a lot of our parents are not literate enough maybe to use it so you're also still excluding sort of certain folks um so i think it's really important to also go in and see uh and speak to folks who are you know exper- to families that are experiencing this and seeing what would be most helpful to them right um we found we were accidentally being inclusive because of you know supporting the home uh we you know a couple of parents said that their child was experiencing developmental delays and so she was really self conscious about going to an anganwadi and doing something because other kids might maybe didn't understand so like the ability to practice at home at her own pace uh was hugely impactful right so maybe there are um ways that sort of technology can be most uh inclusive that we are just not thinking about so yeah. um i think it it is a little bit frightening to sort of have these mandates being set today when i don't think that there is a full understanding of sort of what could be ways to uh you know to to make technology sort of work best right so i think uh, but you know starting to do that and sort of starting that dialogue with families is something that we're prioritizing right now right right no i think um so firstly that that's really cool right the fact that you were able to sort of give a child the confidence to work at home at her own pace and i think that's so important when they're younger especially um and hopefully that like allows her to sort of develop where she wants to be and you know to enter the classroom with a lot more confidence so that's fantastic um and i do think that there's also something to say of sort of um you know the government in their own um sort of delivery of education having not been able to do uh, a lot of these things as well right and maybe they do need to also sort of set by example and lead by example when it comes to some of these more inclusive measures um and specifically with tech uh but so my my question was definitely coming from the perspective of you know with the uh, right persons with disabilities act the rpwd um mm-hmm. it has been mandated for example for the state to ensure a uh, basic sort of measures of inclusion like subtitling and you know a couple of other things for news right um and for now entertainment as well um and so in that lens it's it's a little bit interesting to me that it hasn't come into education policy you know yeah. and not to say that we finished implementing it there of course not and yeah. of course we have so many you know like again news in how many regional languages does news appear and these continue to be inclusion problems that we have right uh, but yeah so so my sense was always that given that we've already sort of created yeah. these kinds of priorities or commitments when it comes to news and entertainment to a certain effect and um for example there was a court case recently that i mean vithi was not personally involved in but we sort of you know um we had some sort of role to you know uh, or like interest in it rather uh, where the court actually ordered that pathan that new sharukh khan mm-hmm. film that's all the range um is supposed to put in same language subtitling for its ott release um mm-hmm. and you know you have like the netflixes of the world and the amazon prime sort of getting behind um these kinds of these kinds of mandates and moves right so yeah just just from the lens of that i wonder 
whether the state should at least start that process of saying, you know, any tech that we have in education, and it doesn't need to be, I mean, you don't have, it's regardless of provider then, right? It's, it's not about yeah. the provider, it's about the uh, ultimate user, really, um, to say that then these just basic things that we do know in terms of subtitling or, you know, maybe not sign language interpretation, because again, how many, uh, especially young children are probably haven't learned that yet, yeah. not going to learn it from tech. So it is, it is definitely extremely complicated. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah and, and I think, uh, again, right, it also depends on where that burden is going, right? So, um, you know, where does it make sense to, you know, have that mandate, right? Is it with the creators of, because I mean, vernacular content is just not around, right? So yeah. uh, there's already a small pool. And then if you sort of, you know, have a mandate that's a blanket, I think that leads to things like, uh, you know, maybe when RTE came in and sort of, you know, you throw the baby out of the bathwater a little bit, right? Um, uh, and making sort of the best be completely the enemy of the good, uh, right? So I think uh, they need to be, uh, but I think sort of MOE or MO, uh, the Ministry of, I think, Information Technology, someone is mm -hmm. creating sort of um, a tool that can help uh, translate between regional languages, right? right. Which in itself is a form of in inclusion because, uh, you know, there are migrant children we know in our program who are not really benefiting because they don't know the local language. Um, you know, there's, again, sort of the lack of vernacular. So if they can be, and there are tools now, I think, that are getting made that can do you know artificial intelligence based subtitling yes. so i think providing that kind of technological support um might be a little bit more effective because just the number of vernacular content creators and the resources and investments they can make is actually quite low right yeah no that yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah i think a lot of this so uh, same language subtitling thing as well um, it does come down to that, right? Like who sort of takes on the burden of actually implementing these things, um, even when the state says that it is or isn't mandated. I think that's still the question that everyone will raise, which is very fair. Um, yeah, it's okay, like making, so, you know, Pathan can afford it, especially yeah. <laughs> with the questions they're doing, but it, it's going to be more difficult uh, for a lot of other content providers. Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. And maybe that's something then that we need to figure out through sort of experimentation with these other industries, right? And like find the most efficient solutions um, so that we're not just like putting, like you said, a blanket sort of mandate, but we're also coming with solutions along with that, right? Or yeah. like some sort of support systems for the same. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, okay, so I mean, we, we have this conversation has gone on for some time, but so I'll just sort of end with like one final question. So given, you know, what we know about um, the importance of early childhood education and what we know about how COVID maybe affected um, children's, you know, early enrollment into school or delayed it in some cases, and as well as some of the broader sort of challenges with being out of school in general, where do you think in your sort of experience and your interactions with the state, where do you think the state should be sort of prioritizing its energy when it comes to solving this problem of um, OSC? And I mean, you could also answer it specifically for the younger age groups, but, you know, as, as you wish. Yeah. Yeah, I think for, I mean, actually in the younger age group, all pretty much all kids are out of school, right? Very few of them are actually going to um, preschool or any formal learning. They're going to an Anganwadi center, which might not yet be a center of learning. Um, and in urban areas, increasingly, even in rural areas, they might be going to, um, you know, private uh, tuition or preschools that are completely age inappropriate, right? So I think for our age group, effectively 90% of kids are out of school. Uh, and so sort of the very, you know, basic, um, uh, you know, next set of initiatives need to be around, uh, you know, creating, as I said, sort of a public narrative about early learning, about how early learning needs to be focused on play instead of road-based memorization heavy uh, traditional learning and then equipping somebody around the child, right? Whether that's uh, ideally an Anganwadi worker or a teacher um, or somebody in the family and ideally somebody in the family to sort of give a child that kind of nurturing uh, care and sort of learning experiences and stimulation that sort of make them uh, ready for school, right? Wherever they go. 
Um, so that's kind of the, uh, you know, the early education out to school kind of answer. I think uh, on a whole, um, I think, again, right, like India's done really well in terms of enrollment. Uh, so I think those last remaining out of school kids who are, of course, at the very forefront, right, of um, of vulnerability and maybe marginalized there have to be better systems as you said right of um you know finding them of uh maybe more creative solutions around understanding what school means for those parents for those kids right maybe understanding if there's a different need um I remember when we used to work on childcare centers in Seva, uh, we used to work with some, you know, rag pickers and they said, it doesn't work for us to have a childcare center that starts at nine because mm -hmm. um, we go to work at four. So what can you do for our kids between 4 a.m. and, you know, 10 a.m. when we are out, right? When it's the busiest part of our day. So maybe, you know, we have to be more creative around solutions uh, for these families that, you know, again, most, you know, every parent wants the best for their child is one of our operating principles. So figuring out like what, what constraints they're facing and how can we sort of ease those best. Right. Yeah. No, I think that that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. And I feel like, again, it comes back to, you know, the point of 98% of children in these early years are effectively out of school. I think that's an important sort of number for us to start talking about right because I don't think we see it that way and and you're very right about that because of course because it's not formalized it's not recognized as a right to early childhood education yet um, it is obviously something that's not a part of the estimation of out of school children as well right um, so yeah I mean I, I think thank you for that framing I think that's a very important sort of way to look at it um, for these next few years while we try to get EC, um, you know, a legislative framework or whatever. Um, and yeah, this this other piece as well, right? Understanding why children are sort of dropping out. And I think it again ties back to having some sort of community perspective or community tie-in because that's, I mean, just tracking them as a number is obviously not going to work, uh, but sort of understanding the constraints and like you said, what education means to these families and, you know, when it matters and how it matters and what's the best way to sort of deliver it. I think that's a, that's a really, really important and good point as well. Um, okay. So on that note, I mean, if do you, do you have any more questions for sort of us or anything else you'd like to add? No, I think this was great. I've spoken enough. No one wants to listen to me more than this. <laughs> but this was such a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Uh, and yeah, really excited to uh, go through the report in more detail. Um, and thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Namia, for joining us. This podcast is produced by the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy under the Kota Karma Vidhi Inclusive Education Program. The Kota Karma Vidhi Inclusive Education Program is a CSR initiative by Kotak Mahindra Bank Limited. This podcast is based and born from Vidhi's report, Clearing the Air, a synthesized mapping of out-of-school children during COVID-19 in India. This report is produced under funding received from Voltas Limited as part of their CSR initiative. Video design and editing by Asad Ali, illustration by Hitesh Sonar.